Good afternoon. Sorry to be a few minutes late. Just start with a couple things. Earlier today, Evan Gershkovich appeared in a courtroom in Yekaterinburg, Russia. We have been clear from the start that journalism is not a crime and that Evan should never have been detained in the first place. What happened today was a performance put on by Russian authorities to justify their repression of journalists and independent voices. Embassy Moscow officials were granted brief access to the courtroom before proceedings began. However, they were not permitted to speak to Evan. Russia should stop using individuals like Evan Gershkovich and Paul Wayland as bargaining chips. They should both be released immediately, and I can uh, uh, attest to both Evan and Paul and their families that the United States will not rest until we have brought both of them home. And then on uh, one note, just uh, much closer to home, so this is the last week of Nathan Tech, the deputy spokesperson who is ending his tour in the spokesperson's office at the end of the week and moving on to hopefully greener pastures. Um, uh, he has been agreed, agreed. Uh, Nathan has been uh, an absolute uh, joy to work with, uh, one of the people that makes this place really work, uh, does a lot of hard things and makes them look easy. And I've appreciated him, uh, uh, appreciated all his efforts uh, on behalf of the spokesperson's office and uh, wish him well in his next endeavors. So thank you, thank you Nathan. And with that, Matt. Uh, right, sorry, I was late, so I'll, 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 I'll defer to. Can we follow up on Evan while sure. you start with that? Um, uh, given uh, officials in, in the Biden administration have said, you know, once um, a trial begins, it's not highly likely that there will be a deal to secure um, that person's release. Now that we're seeing this trial begin, uh, what do you guys expect in terms of the likelihood of any deal coming to fruition in the near term here? I don't want to make any kind of public assessment uh, or speak to negotiations that happen, of course, in private. We have been working to bring both Evan and Paul home since they were detained. And as we've said, we put, have put a significant offer on the table some months ago. Um, we continue to work uh, privately to try to secure their release. We shouldn't have to do that. Uh, they should both be released immediately, but we will continue our efforts. Um, we, those have been happening before Evan's trial. They will continue during the trial. And uh, should he be convicted, which of course he will be, it's not a free trial, um, they will continue after the trial, but we wanna see him returned home immediately. And that significant offer that you guys have repeatedly referred to that was put on the table months ago, um, has that offer been re-upped in any way or changed and put back on the table in any way? Or are we still standing at that singular offer that you guys keep pointing back to? I just don't want to speak to this in public. I don't want to negotiate in public. I've seen that Russian officials have made comments about uh, uh, this matter in, in recent days, and I don't want to respond to those either. We are working day and night to try to secure the release of both Evan and Paul, and that will continue. Just hold on. Uh, yeah. correct, the, the embassy officials were ushered out prior to the... They were there before the start of the hearing, and they were not allowed to attend the hearing itself. Thank you. What can you tell us about his condition? Uh, we all saw his pictures from this glass, you know, uh, uh, behind the, the glass cage. Um, where is he being held? right now during the trial. Uh, I can follow up with you that off. I don't have it here at the podium. I can follow up with this where did they have, held off. Did, did embassy officials have a chance to interact with him? They did not. I said that in my <laughs> opening statements. And I know you guys don't typically get into politics from this podium, but given that it um, directly you know, intersects with your efforts to secure um, Evan, the former president, uh, Trump, who's now the Republican nominee, um, said earlier that did you do um, Evan would be released prior to him taking office if he wins the election on November 5th. Um, is that is there any legitimacy to that claim as far um, as this building knows? So I am not going to deal with comments made in a political context in a political campaign. But I would note that I would hope that every American who cares about the safety and security of their fellow American citizens would demand the release of Evan and Paul now. Not November, not December, not January, but now. That ought to be the position of every American um, because I would hope that every American citizen wants to see these two wrongfully detained Americans return home immediately. Yes, yes, Janie? Thank you very much and uh, two questions. Uh, North Korea's uh, launched another ballistic missile early yesterday morning and following the spray of garbage uh, balloons uh, into South Korea. Uh, due to the impact of these trace balloons, 
operation at Incheon International Airport are being disrupted and the flight cancellation occurred. What comment can you make on this? Uh, we continue to call on the DPRK to refrain from these provocative actions and return to diplomacy. And the uh, Russian uh, deputy foreign minister said that uh, South Korea must retaliate North Korea and Russia recent agreement. On the other hand, it, is, it was announced that the North Korean workers uh, would be dispatched to reconstruction for Donetsk, Ukraine. How do you view this? So I don't have any specific comment on that. I had not seen that report. But obviously, we have been quite concerned about the uh, burgeoning relationship between North Korea and Russia. Obviously, Donetsk is part of Ukraine, not part of Russia. Uh, and so any kind of uh, increased cooperation between those two countries when it relates to activities on occupied uh, Ukrainian territory is something that we would oppose. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, moving on to Julian Assange, uh, now that he's free and in Australia, um, are you satisfied with the outcome of this? And, that, uh, uh, and can you give us any uh, details on the uh, dip diplomatic negotiations that you that went ongoing between Australia, the US, UK, and all that? Give yeah. us any light on that. So with respect to the first question, I'm not going to uh, have any comment, only because uh, under our system we have an independent Justice Department that makes its own decisions on these matters, and it's appropriate that they be the ones that speak to them uh, and not uh, have other departments in the United States weigh in one way or the other. That has uh, always been our uh, case, but of course we have confidence in our colleagues at the Justice Department to make these decisions and uh, make them in full uh, with the full interests of the United States in mind. As it pertains to uh, involvement of the State Department, I can tell you it's very limited only in the last few days. This was a matter that was handled uh, by the Justice Department through law enforcement channels. There was some uh, small coordination role between our embassy uh, and the Australian government just in the past few days. Um, but this was, uh, other than that, a law enforcement matter uh, handled through law enforcement channels. But are you satisfied that the case is over? Um, so look, uh, the Justice Department has spoken to that, and I don't have anything yeah, to add. The obviously, the, obviously, the um, uh, the ambassador put out a statement that said um, uh, we were happy to work with our Australian colleagues on it, and that remains the case. I do think it is important when we talk about Julian Assange to remind the world that the actions um, for which he was indicted and for which he has now pled guilty are actions that put the lives of our partners, uh, our allies, and our diplomats at risk, especially those who work in dangerous places like Afghanistan and Iraq. This was some years ago now, almost 15 years ago, so I think the world has forgotten much of it. But if you recall, when WikiLeaks first disseminated uh, and published State Department documents, State Department cables, they did so without redacting names. Uh, they just threw them out there for the world to see. And so um, the documents they published gave identifying information of individuals who were in contact with the State Department that included uh, opposition leaders, human rights activists around the world um, whose positions were put in some danger because of their public disclosure. It also chilled the ability of American personnel to build relationships and have frank conversations with them. And at the time, those of you who covered the State Department uh, at the time will probably remember that in the days leading up to that release, the State Department really had to scramble to get people out of danger, to move them out of harm's way. It was an extraordinary uh, effort performed by dozens of government officials around the world, but that doesn't change the danger that those actions put innocent people all around the world in um, through no fault of their own. And that's, of course, not even to mention the, the further actions by WikiLeaks down the road to essentially serve as a conduit for Russian intelligence uh, interfering in a U.S. presidential election. Sorry, so I, I actually did cover the State Department back then, and I, I don't remember there being any public, um, that there was a public concern that was raised about the potential security risk posed to uh, sources uh, who might have been quoted. Was there actually any, uh, did you ever discover anyone who was injured, killed, uh, had to go into hiding so, uh, because of them? So a few things about that. One. I can't give you a definitive answer, only because I wasn't here at the time and so much time. And okay, so, but uh, hold on. So, oh, no, but, 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 no let me, my, Matt, just... let me finish. I have a full answer on it. Okay. One, I can't speak to that because it was some years ago, and I don't have a full you know, accounting of what happened. But number two, the State Department did an extraordinary amount of work when we found out that these cables were going to be published 
to get people out of harm's way, to go around and look at what might become public and take action so people that would be put in danger um, would be put out of harm's way. But third, you know, if you drive drunk down the street and get pulled over for drunk driving, the fact that you didn't crash into another car and kill someone doesn't get you out of the, uh, uh, of your, the reckless actions and the endangerment that you put your fellow citizens in. And it's the same thing, the same principle applies here. Right. Well, I, 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 and I, I don't think that it does. But the fact of the matter is, is that the State Department has been, at least as far as I know, and maybe I'm wrong, um, but has, been, has never been able to point to anyone who uh, was compromised or killed or you know put, put, put at risk because 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 of this. their identities were compromised the state department well, went to great work to get people out of harm's way to prevent you know that what, very action from happening do you know how many people about uh, as i said this was some time ago i was in the government at the time not at the state department i'd have to go back and look at it but i do know that there was work around the world especially in places um, like afghanistan iraq and other you know other places around the world where they did have to do a, a, a great amount of work to kind of move people well out one of, of way. one of your predecessors P.J. Crowley went to, who was the standing at the podium at the time, went to great pains to talk about the potential damage that uh, could or would be caused by these revelations. And I, you know, unless I missed it, I, I didn't hear that there was any. As, as I said, number one, the department went to a great amount of effort to avoid people being put in harm's way. But... It doesn't absolve anyone of their responsibility. I know, but it's an, but, but I, I know you're not. But it's an important point. Just because <clears throat> people were able to mitigate the harm done by your actions, that doesn't absolve you of your actions in the first place. Okay. Shannon, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. One other thing. You said there was some some uh, small coordination between the U.S. and Australia over the last couple of days. Was that involving the Just flight? Just with, with which with relation to his landing and transfer in Australia. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up? It said in the sure. agreement that uh, Mr. Assange will not be able to enter the United States without permission. Who will he be seeking permission from? Who would grant that permission, and how would that happen if that were to occur? It would. Uh, so I'm not going to speak to provisions in what was a Justice Department plea agreement, but that would be handled uh, as is the case for anyone seeking uh, permission to enter the United States. And in the judgment, uh, the sentencing part of the judgment, the, the judge noted that there were no victims of Mr. Assange's uh, behavior, which is part of the reason that the sentence was what it was. Do you disagree with that? Do you think there were victims of his actions? I'm not going to um, speak to a uh, comment made by a judge in a ruling. That would never be appropriate for me to do so, but I'll stand by the comments I made just a moment ago. What? Hmm? You're not going to speak to a comment made by a judge. I mean, if he if he did, I didn't. I don't know that he did, but that's exactly the point of my question. Yeah, I, but I'm not. Earlier, I'm, I'm, which is that that the State Department has never come up, even though it was one of the prime quote unquote victims of 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 the, these leaks, uh, was never able to identify anyone who uh, came under who point, was killed or came point. under came under. I think the point I made a moment ago is an appropriate response to that, which is just because the State Department was able to take actions to keep people out of harm's way, people okay. that you put well, in so harm's way, it doesn't absolve the responsibility. What actions did the State Department they were able, take? The State Department at the time was able to reach out to individuals whose names oh, were going to be, I can't tell you that, it's almost 15 years ago, Matt, I wasn't here. Um, well, I know, uh, but, but, but I, mean, but I look, know, but, but the I can case has just come to a close. But I, that, you know, you know, I would cannot have. give you a full account of something that happened almost 15 years ago, but people that were here will tell you that the State Department went to great lengths to reach out to people whose identities were exposed uh, and get them out of harm's way. And the other point I made is that it does, when something like that to hap happens, it does chill the ability of American personnel to build relationships with people and count on no doubt. count on the fact that the information they provide us will be held, no, uh, held no confidential. Doubt. So it is not just a harm to or potential harm to the safety and security of those individuals. It's a harm to uh, American diplomacy. No doubt. But but the fact of the matter is that you have not been ever been able to identify a a anything tangible about uh, any. N tangible negative effect. That is a different. So I think I just did point to a tangible negative effect when it had when people are less willing to trust the United States government. To okay, well, give me an example. Information uh, who, secret. Who, who was willing to? It was a. To so I was in I was in government at the time, and I can tell you, traveling the world uh, with a different. Okay. Um, a, so, di a different a different agency. We often heard from foreign okay. counterparts that they were. I'm obviously not so going to speak to. Who? 
And I'm not going to speak to the exact conversations, but we often heard from foreign counterparts that they were worried about providing information to the United States government because of our ability to keep okay. it. Well, uh, I, I, I remember one having been here at the time, and I remember that Berlusconi told former Secretary Clinton that he was concerned, mainly because of what the WikiLeaks, uh, what the cables <laughs> suggested about his, uh, you know, Activities and uh, there were um, the, yeah there were more yes there were more uh, uh, substantive and serious concerns yeah. were there yeah. okay yeah can Race. you name can you name a, no, I'm, I'm, not I'm, a person so maybe, a so country I or, think you, you could know. see why if the point of the conversation is someone raising concern about private conversations being made public. It wouldn't be helpful for me to then make those private conversations public in response well, to a question said at this podium. Years ago, I'll drop yeah. it. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Yeah. The multiple reports uh, claiming that Russian uh, government plane was uh, headed to New York this morning. Are you in a position to confirm it? What are they doing there? It's the first time since last year. I don't, uh, I'm not able to confirm those reports. I don't have any information about Please it at all. Take it from me if possible. Um, uh, this is call. not the FAA, uh, Alex, so. Uh, about the phone call uh, between, <laughs> between uh, Moscow, uh, between Russian and uh, U.S. Uh, defense uh, ministers, yes. I'm sorry, what's the what? phone, Yesterday's phone call to Moscow. Um, why did the administration uh, feel a need to make that phone call yesterday on the same day when ICC issued an arrest warrant? Why did against, who feel the need to make a phone call? Mm -hmm, I mean, the Secretary of Defense called. Uh, I, it's uh, a question you should direct to the Secretary of Defense or the that, Pentagon, not to the State Department. But is there any change in the administration's policy in terms of discussing Ukraine without Ukraine? There is, of course, there's not. But with respect to questions about calls made by other agencies, especially agencies that hold public briefings, you should go to their public and briefings yeah, and ask yeah. them. Do you have any concern about timing of it? Because yesterday of was- course not. Of course not, of um, course not. On the South Caucasus, uh, yeah. Assistant Secretary is headed to Azerbaijan. He was in Yerevan uh, two weeks ago. He was in Georgia last month. Why having this visit separately to these capitals? Do you guys have- uh, We continue to engage in, in diplomacy to resolve a number of the outstanding issues in that region. So uh, something we've been uh, working on for some time. The Assistant Secretary regularly travels there. Go ahead. Uh, there was a Hill hearing today that singled out China's growing influence in the hemisphere, specifically uh, a megaport that's being built in Peru, set to launch later this year. Uh, is State concerned about China's gaining a stronger foothold in the hemisphere, and what steps are you taking to count? So we have long understood and have spoken to this publicly, the fact that other countries are going to have relationships with China. They're going to have diplomatic relationships with China. We're going to have, they're going to have economic relationships with China. That is no different than the United States. We have diplomatic and economic relationships with China. What we have always made clear to countries around the world, and this very much includes countries in our own hemisphere, is that they need to go into those relationships eyes wide open, and they need to understand um, that if they enter into agreements with China, they ought to ensure that those uh, agreements uh, have transparency, that they are in the inter best interests of uh, their governments and most importantly in, on, in the people of their countries um, uh, and to make sure that they you know, are um, uh, fully, fully meet international standards. How do you? Thank you. On Gaza, uh, half a million people are facing a catastrophic level of hunger, um, especially in the north, and actually WFP is uh, describing the situation as full-blown uh, famine. So what exactly are you doing to pressurize or persuade or Cajul the Israelis to make sure that this is not going to happen and not materialize in actually a full family? So we continue to work uh, day and night. Our special envoy for Middle East humanitarian issues is back in the region uh, today after being back for, uh, in Washington for consultations uh, around Minister Gallant's visit. She's back in the region working on this exact issue today, um, trying to not just get humanitarian aid into Gaza, but most importantly, make sure it is distributed around Gaza. I think everyone's aware that that has been the um, chief impediment to actually getting food to the Palestinian people. It's not getting um, aid into the pier. It's not getting aid into Karim Shalom. It's then making sure that it can be distributed from those points onward. Um, we have had a number of discussions between, um, or have been, been, I should say, we have been involved in a number of discussions in the past few days between the various United Nations agencies uh, and various components of the Israeli government to try to work through some security challenges that the UN is currently facing uh, to deliver humanitarian assistance. Um, we continue to push to try to resolve their uh, legitimate concerns about the safety and security of their personnel and um, are continuing to push to try to get to try to work through some asks that they have on the table uh, pending with the government of Israel to try to 
make it safer for their personnel to take humanitarian assistance and deliver it around uh, to the people of Gaza? That was my follow-up, actually, because the UN said that Israel... I anticipated Israel, that. <laughs> you no, read my mind. Or I, that, that <laughs> Israel... So do you believe that actually the Israelis can improve the way that the UN agencies, especially their workers, are delivering the aid? It could be met. Yeah, there are so there are a number of things that Israel that, that Israel can do. I, t I spoke to some of them yesterday. Some of them is to allow protective personnel equipment, <laughs> uh, protective personal equipment for uh, UN workers. Some is to um, uh, kind of increase communications between the IDF and COGAD and UN workers. And then there's some other things too that the UN workers have asked for that I'm not going to get into from this podium. But there is more that can be done. There are some of the requests where Israel has legitimate security concerns, and what we're trying to do is broker agreements mm. that that give the UN personnel the assurances they need that they can offer uh, that they can operate securely while still protecting leg Israel's legitimate security concerns. One last question is uh, I'm sure you've seen these re detailed reports that most of them have harrowing accounts of Palestinian prisoners being rounded up some of them are being sexually uh, assaulted uh, shackled for hours uh, inhumane conditions and that's a description of Israeli human rights organizations like Bit Salem and others and witnesses who are actually a part of the IDF who came and talked about what happened. So you often uh, uh, call Israel as a, an ally who you shared values with. So how can the United States make sure that these things, which is obviously um, unacceptable for most democracies, that is not uh, allowed to happen? What exactly are you doing what the mechanism that you're using to make sure that this is not happening so, and if you're investigating it yourself so with respect to any investigations there are as i've said before a number of incidents that we are reviewing uh, when it relates to potential human rights abuses potential violations of the laws of war and i'm not going to speak to uh any particular incident from here but there are a number of incidents where uh, uh we have reviews ongoing but that said apart separate and apart from that we have made clear to Israel that we fully expect them to comply with uh, all human rights laws, international laws of war. That includes the, pr the treatment of prisoners and detainees. Um, and when there are abuses, uh, those ought to be investigated. If, uh, if accountability is appropriate, there ought to be accountability. And we'll continue to make that clear then. Sure. Who was that? Who, who asked the question? Yeah, I, yeah. I wanted yeah. to follow Go. on that. Uh, um, and that's the, I would say that's the last time today I'm going to do on without raising hand, but go ahead. Oh, I apologize. I, um, it was a follow yeah, on her. On investigation of the use of Palestinians as human shields or video that was on social media today about Israeli forces using attack dogs, you talk about investigations. Logistically, what does an investigation look like and when would we see results? of that type of investigation? So it depends um, whose investigation you're speaking to. If you mean the, the reviews that are going on by the United States, there are personnel inside the State Department that conduct reviews with respect to the laws of war uh, in this conflict, as we do in other places around the, uh, the world. And I don't speak to the those reviews before they're finalized, um, uh, nor can I um, uh, preview when they would, um, when they would be finished. But I, just to speak to some of the complexity that we face in launching those reviews, and it's the same complexity I face sometimes in answering questions about this from the podium. So yesterday, um, Doctors Without Borders put out a statement saying that a doctor uh, who was a member of Doctors Without Borders was killed by an IDF strike while I believe on its way to work inside Gaza. I was asked about it at the podium. I said, I can't give you an assessment on that strike because I don't know the details. Hours later, the IDF put out a statement saying that that particular doctor was also a terrorist member of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who was a member of their a, a participant in their rocket program. I don't have the ability to litigate that claim. We don't, uh, at first uh, blush, often have the ability to litigate claims made by the different parties in this conflict. And so I know sometimes when I'm asked to, to pronounce judgment, it's frustrating that we can't do it. But that is, the incident yesterday is the exact situation why oftentimes in the middle of a conflict, it is difficult to draw uh, definitive conclusions when there is conflicting information that we all face. So I will say as it pertains to our reviews, we collect information from all the relevant parties. Um, as we said when we released a report on this matter uh, some time ago, um, we have open inquiries to the government of Israel uh, asking for information about these specific incidents and we'll continue, those reviews uh, will continue. Sorry, on this though, do you have any reason to believe that the IDF claim is more credible than the 
MSF claim? So both things can be true. What MSF com com claimed was that he was a doctor who was a member of MSF. Okay. What Israel claimed Are you is that, in that that's wrong. No, I'm not saying that's wrong. What oh. what what Israel claimed is that he was a doctor who was a member of MSF who was also a terrorist involved in Palestinian Islamic Jihad's rocket program. My point is. Okay. Neither of those are and, United and, States verified information. Right, so so when I get asked about the IDF claim, but he was a doctor and he was also involved in the in, in Hamas's missile program, rocket program, rocket program. rocket program. Yeah. Yeah. How? I don't know that, but that well, goes did, no, no. Did, that goes to my. Did the IDF tell you? They put out a statement on this. They, I mean, this goes to my. Doing? This goes to my exact point that you see claims made by various parties on the ground, and then oftentimes you see conflicting yeah. claims made by the IDF. We will reach out to our well, Israeli partners about. We will, hold on. We will reach out to our Israeli partners for more information about these, but oftentimes when I'm asked for definitive conclusions about the the um, specifics of a strike. We are operating on incomplete information, and that's why as frustrating as it is, is why I can't well, offer a definitive there are conclusion about any one strike. in history where yeah. physicians have been, you know, also criminals of some kind. That's, or, that's or my point. Yeah. But you're just saying that you're just saying, well, MSF, which is a respectable organization, IDF, a respectable organization, but they have completely different uh, views. So. You guys need to come in and in, in, in the middle and decide what could, you know. And that's don't you? That is what we do with respect to the ongoing assessments. That's the point I, I was making. Two points I was making. One with respect to ongoing assessments. When you look at that information environment, sometimes that's why it takes time to reach a definitive conclusion because. Things aren't as simple as they appear at first blush, right? I get a question about well, it. Hold on, I, I, I get a question know, about it yesterday. No, it I could be as simple as it, they were at first blush. You just don't. You don't that, know. That, exactly right, and you don't. Okay. That, you don't know. The second thing is that's why it's hard, oftentimes, to give definitive answers when I get asked about this from the podium because information changes, more information comes to light, and maybe that information is correct, maybe it's not. We try to gather it and make def definitive but, determinations. But Matt, don't you make assessment to other countries when you don't have equally the same information? Whether it's Iran, whether it is China, whether even an ally, Russia, or Ukraine, or others. So, is it just with Israel that you're always no. unable to make that conclusive result? Uh, uh, no. Results, or is it just so, because you don't have the information? So, first of all, I would say there are times when it is quite obvious what happened, and we do make specific uh, determinations. Very quickly, so look at the World Central Kitchen strike, where it's quite obvious within a few hours, within certainly the first 24 hours, what happened and that it was a mistaken strike, and we spoke to that exactly. Other times, it is less clear. So that's that's the first thing. But then I would say, with respect to Israel, as, uh, as with any other country, we make determinations based on the information that's available to us. We reach out, in this case, to NGOs and others who are on the ground, and we reach out to the government of Israel when trying to make assessments about individual strikes before making any def definitive conclusions. But you do accept at least what both sides agree on, that this person was a doctor. I have no reason to dispute that. Both, I have no reason to dispute at all that he was a doctor. And to be clear, I'm sorry. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'm sorry, still laughing, but and to be clear, you have explicitly asked Israel for evidence that this doctor was involved in. Hamas's I don't know if we program. have in in with res pertains to this strike. We often do. Will you? It is no. Hold on, I'm saying we often do when it comes to strikes like these, when there are claims of human rights abuses or claims of civilian casualties. It is regular practice for us to do so uh, through our embassy in, Jer in Jerusalem. I can't say we've done so in this case, but it would be normal practice for us to have done so. I just don't have verified that we did in this one specific one or that we're not doing it in the coming days, but it would be our standard practice to do so, yes. We move to um, Kenya. Sure. I'm sure we can, we can move back later. Um, so, uh, according to the White House, you've, uh, the, the administration has been in touch with, with the Kenyan government after the, um, the, the shootings of protesters yesterday. You expressed concern about, about the violence. Um, uh, but since then, the, the Kenya has, has withdrawn the, the bill that was being discussed. Is that something that, you, that the U.S. sort of pushed for or, uh, or welcomes? So, I won't speak to the withdrawing of the bill. That ultimately is a matter for the Kenyan government to, to determine. Um, I will say that in our conversations with the Kenyan government, what we did is um, 
uh, tell them that the freedom of peaceful assembly and habeas corpus are rights that are enshrined in the Kenyan Constitution. And we urge them to ensure that the Kenyan security forces uh, use non-lethal methods and prevent civilian harm in responding to any security concerns. Um, yesterday, I think in the White House comments today, that it talked about reports of of violence against protesters. It sounds like you you have a little bit more of a solid conclusion. Like, do you, do you, do you have a fi like a, a, an understanding of what actually happened? Yeah, we've seen well documented reports of um, violence against protesters, and what we have said is in our con in our conversation with that with the Kenyan government is that um, they should use non lethal methods and prevent civilian harm in dealing with peaceful protests. And you know, this is the same country that that has obviously sent police to to Haiti for this. Uh, multinational um, security support mission. Uh, does that raise concerns to you about, you know, uh, if you've got those particular concerns about how Kenyan security forces are operating, you know, in, inside their country, uh, should we be concerned about what, how they're going to operate now in Haiti? So a few things uh, with respect to that. Number one, uh, all MSS mission personnel, both from Kenya and from other countries that we expect to participate in the MSS, receive pre-deployment training. That is in accordance with UN training standards for similar UN missions, uh, including training on human rights, child protection, countering sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, we've also worked with Kenya and other partners to integrate critically important accountability and oversight me measures in accordance with the authorizing UN Security Council resolution. Um, and that includes operating in the highest standards of transparency, conduct, and discipline, and includes compliance mechanisms to prevent, investigate, address, and publicly report any violations or abuses of human rights related to the MSS mission. So we have both, uh, working with the UN and others, um, worked to establish training on the front end and then to ensure transparency and accountability for any alleged abuses on the back end should they occur. Who has oversight over, over that mission? The United Nations, ultimately. It's um, a United Nations uh, Security Council authorized mission. Sure. Also on Kenya, President Ruto claimed that organized uh, crime groups infiltrated those protests. Uh, is that a claim that they've also repeated in your private conversations? And also, uh, do you see any validity that that happened? So um, I'm not going to speak to private conversations, and I can't assess the validity of that or not. I would say, in addition to the point I made about um, restraint by Kenyan security forces, we do urge Kenyan protesters not to put anyone including uh, government officials in harm's way. Protesters, protesters should remain peaceful in Kenya as they should remain peaceful all around the world. Yeah, Peter. Um, this morning, uh, the secretary released the 2023 International Freedom uh, Religious, Religious Freedom Report, where there is a considerable chapter on Iran. Today is also the International Day in Support of Victims of Torture which is torture is rampant in Iranian jails uh, per your own annual reports on human rights in Iran. Uh, on Tuesday, yesterday, a group of um, political prisoners in Iran, they called, they asked that the world pay more attention to the human rights situation in Iran, especially in view of the recent comment by Ali Khamenei that uh, among the officials uh, of the judiciary system, he was saying, ignore international or Western, quote unquote, Western human rights standards and uh, only national laws apply. Now I was wondering, besides sanctions against Iranian officials, what other alternatives do you have to try to secure uh, Iranian people's human rights? So first of all, we absolutely agree that the world should pay more attention to the oppression of the Iranian people. And one of the things that we have done since the outset of this administration is to work to highlight human rights abuses inside Iran, highlight crackdowns on uh, the freedom of the Iranian people. And we do that not just through our bilateral engagements uh, around the world. We do it through public reports that we issue. You referred to one of them. And we also do it working through international fora where we consistently raise the regime's brutal crackdown and brutal repression of the Iranian people and encourage other countries to raise their voices and object to it publicly and object to it privately. Um, we also take measures to ensure that the Iranian people can stay connected to the outside world. We've talked before, you've heard me talk before from this podium about what we have done to ensure that they have uh, access to the internet through VPNs um, so they, the Iranian people can find out from independent news sources outside Iran 
more about what their government is doing. Um, and then I do think the measures that we impose, uh, the accountability measures that we impose are important. We, can, we have imposed more than, I believe it's 600 sanctions and other measures on Iran, Iran and Iran-related entities since the outside of this administration. Some of those are for their support for terrorism and the other destabilizing actions, but a number of them are for their oppression of the Iranian people, and we will continue to take those actions as appropriate. But Matt, sanctions don't, are not helping people. Well, so my, my point is sanctions are just one of the tools in our arsenal, ultimately calling out that oppression, making sure other countries focus on it, and we wish more countries would. Let's be perfectly frank. It would be, uh, we would welcome other countries objecting to the brutal crackdowns of the Iranian people. We see some, of course, um, uh, and to that statement, yes, a lot of them are in the Western world. We would welcome every country in the world uh, speaking out against Iran's brutal crackdowns. Um, and as I said, we also work to support the Iranian people, and those are the measures that we have available to us, and we will continue to use them. Well, clearly, they're not going to listen, as Khamenei has said, to... I certainly don't think the, the, uh, the, the regime in Tehran is going to listen, but as I said, we're going to continue to um, try to make sure the Iranian people can also get information from uh, outside sources, and we, su we support the Iranian people in, um, uh, in their rights to exercise their freedom of expression and other uh, basic rights available to them. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Staying on the religious uh, freedom. Uh, in your report in the Iraqi section, it says that restrictions on freedom of religion remain widespread outside of Kurdistan, but in some parts of the Iraq. And also, there are continual reports of violence by the armed groups, sectarian groups like Iranian backed groups on the religious minority in Iraq, especially in Sinjar, that the people, Yazidi people, they fear to go back to the region because of these groups. So what tools and what measures do you have and have you put in place against these groups in order to take so, their responsibility? So first of all, when it comes to the report that we released today, I'm not going to be able to give you a detailed answer uh, as it pertains to what's in the report. It's a long, detailed report, covers uh, scores of countries around the world, and I'm um, you know, not an expert who can speak to every every piece of information that was in the, the, um, the report. I will say the report itself is a um, uh, uh, the point of the report itself is to make information public. It is not a um, it is not the vehicle through which we impose accountability measures. It is the vehicle that informs the policy choices that we make. So it is one of the things that we do to gather information, to make that information public, and then we take into account all the information that's in the report to it to inform the policy choices. None of which I'm going to uh, preview yeah, from here. Another question on the Kurdistan region after. After a long postponement, today the Kurdistan region President Najib Bazani sets October 20th as the new date for the Kurdistan region's election. As the U.S. government were engaged and so encouraged the Kurdistan region to schedule a date for that election, so what's your comment on that? And how do you see the process of preparation for that election and also the recent change to the election in that region? So we welcome the announcement of parliamentary elections on October 20th in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Elections are a vital element of the democratic process, and we expect the authorities to ensure that they are free, transparent, and occur without further delay. And we appreciate the uh, Iraqi Kurdistan region's president's efforts to reach agreement between all parties. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the member of the uh, Foreign uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee wrote a letter to Secretary Blinken calling uh, for a strong diplomatic response on Indian government's involvement in in assassination attempt on a U.S. citizen at U.S. soil. They're also asking for a briefing on this matter. What is your response on this? So we will respond to those um, uh, members. Um, uh privately, as, as we always do. I won't speak to that here. But as, as pertains to the other issue, um, when this fir issue first arose, we made clear that we had raised, raised it with um, the government of India um, and told them that we expected there to be a full investigation. They've announced that they are conducting an inquiry, um, and we will look forward to the results of that inquiry. So U.S. lawmakers yesterday passed a resolution supporting democracy in Pakistan. In a significant uh, bipartisan support, U.S. lawmakers urged Biden administration to collaborate with Pakistan in, uphold, uphold, in upholding democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Any comments on that? So I'm not going to comment on that resolution specifically, but speaking generally, um, uh, our most senior officials, including Secretary Blinken and Ambassador Blum, have consistently, both privately and publicly, urged Pakistan to respect the rights of its people and live with its constitutional and international obligations. We uh, continuously urge the government of Pakistan to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms. <laughs> 
including the freedoms of expression, association, peaceful assembly, uh, and religion, as well as the rights of marginalized populations such as women and religious minorities. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, about uh, Kurdistan parliamentary elections, how do you expect the elections to be conducted and what steps will you take to ensure their success? I don't have anything to um, speak to, I don't have anything to add beyond the comment that uh, I gave a moment ago. Um, elections are obviously a vital important of a, the democratic process and we welcome the announcement of parliamentary elections uh, on October 20th. So, go ahead. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to ask about the IRF report in regards to China. Uh, Secretary Blinken said that religious freedom is the worst it's been, citing a Pew Research poll um, study that uh, says it's the worst it's been since 2001 when it first started recording. Um, in China, uh, the, the House just passed a bill yesterday called the um, Falun Gong Protection Act, which would sanction any individual involved in forced organ harvesting uh, related to the Chinese government. Um, it would uh, so it would also stop the U.S. from cooperating with China in the organ transplant field. Uh, what further measures does the State Department have in countering the forced organ harvesting in, by the Chinese regime? So let me take that comment back and get you. A, uh, let me take that back and get you a comment. Um, um, sorry, is the, is the IRS oh, yeah. out? Uh, I believe it's out. The secretary did a public event earlier today. So, yeah, um, <laughs> it should be released. Yeah, I think it's posted uh, okay. online. So I don't think it was uh, sent to. A my my apologies if that's correct, <laughs> and I have no reason to doubt it is. But we will we will uh, we will it's get it to you, Simon. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, sir. Two questions, please. One is uh, as far as they're talking about democracy and U.S.-India relations, uh, a lot of analysis were going on as far as this uh, uh, largest uh, elections on the globe, 700 plus million people went to the polls in India. And uh, by the Indian American community here, and also analysis in India and pr uh, press. Um, what they are saying is that uh, many groups and people here in the US, they undermined the democracy of India, that they wanted to break the democracy or the government there. What happened? A lot of people here, they have admitted that they have sent a lot of money from here, including a billionaire to defeat uh, Prime Minister Modi or undermine the democracy in India. What I'm asking you here, do we follow all these things as far as the largest democracy, India, and the oldest democracy, the United States of America? And uh, so many reports also have come out and we're going through so many ups and downs uh, between the two countries, but uh, relations are great, uh, greater, all the officials here in India are talking about. So where we stand about this uh, in the future as far as undermining the democracy uh, in India because of some groups they might not uh, like or they hate uh, something in India or maybe Prime Minister Modi or the democracy there. So I can't speak to those specific reports. I'm not just not sure what they refer to, but I can tell you at, when it comes to the, election, the Indian elections, we have been quite clear on behalf of the United States government that we celebrate what was the largest exercise of democracy in the history of the world. It was an extraordinary achievement. And then when it comes to the outcome of the election, we obviously take no side. That's, that is a question for the people of India to decide. And, and, and thank you so much. And before I go, my second question, if I just follow quickly on this one, Prime Minister Modi said that uh, he is a friend with every leader around the globe and he has very good relations with the President Biden and the United States and uh, we have no ill of any kind with against anybody and I have never done anything wrong with anybody and why they have been doing this to me. Uh, that's what he said, but anyway, it's a statement. My second question is, sir, that as far as Afghanistan is concerned, there will be now a uh, UN Women's Conference and Summit on Afghanistan uh, and what they are saying now before the con conference that uh, um, Taliban have broken their promise to the international global community they made and uh, women in uh, Afghanistan are under or girls they cannot go to school there is no freedom of press no freedom of worship nothing and they are going through really, really a lot and they are crying and they are helping 
uh, need, need a help or asking help from the United States and from the global community to help them out. So if this is a, a reference to the UN-led Doha, Confer Doha 3 conference, which I know they just announced, um, yes, sir. Uh, it's ultimately defer to the UN to talk about the details of the meeting. The U.S. will participate, both our special representative uh, for Afghanistan, Tom West, and our special envoy for Afghan women, girls, and human rights, Rina Amari, will be attending. Um, they, but I should note, they only committed to, participant, to participate once they secured clarity regarding the substantive agenda and more importantly, confirmed that there would be meaningful engagement at the conference uh, with Afghan women and members of Afghan uh, civil society. And so we will be participating in that conference because we, takes, um, we will continue with the international community to impress upon the Taliban that they need to take seriously their obligations under the Doha agreement and that includes with regards to the treatment of women and girls, which of course continues to be appalling. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so I know you talked about uh, Kenya, that the U.S. is calling for the Kenyan forces to use uh, non-lethal methods, but uh, is the U.S. government investigating reports of abductions by police during these protests in Kenya? I just don't have any further uh, comment to make other than what I already, I already said about. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and what's the latest on the Gaza Pier? Uh, I would refer you to the Pentagon for that, but they have made clear over the last few days that the Gaza Pier is operational. It is receiving aid. Uh, I think they had um, a number of reporters who were actually at the pier over the last couple of days. Um, so, yeah, it's operational. And um, is the U.S. concerned that Israel and Hezbollah will fight a full-scale war? Uh, we have been made quite clear that we do not want to see further escalation, and we have been pursuing a diplomatic resolution to the situation along the Israel-Lebanese border. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, big debate tomorrow. Has <laughs> the secretary played any role whatsoever in wait, debate? Wait, which tomorrow? one is that? Um, uh, yeah. No, he's not. not. He's not. No. Played no role. No. Um, Just yeah. one final question. Um, do you have anything to say on the report of the a U.S. diplomat who died at a hotel in Kiev, reportedly? Uh, I do, and so we can confirm the death of a U.S. government employee who was under Chief of Mission Authority at Embassy Kiev. We extend our deepest condolences to the family and loved ones of our colleague. Um, don't have any further comment about the situation other than to say, and uh, I hate to even bring this up, but I know sometimes you know, conspiracy theories spin out of control, that uh, is our understanding that he died of natural causes and there's no sign of foul play. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Wait, 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 I just want to go back to the one thing yeah. that Kylie asked at the very beginning when she asked of you about uh, Trump's comments on, um, on Evan Gershkovich. Gershkovich. Um, there is actual and alleged precedent for deals try, being tried to, uh, you know, for people trying to arrange deals for um, detainees. Uh, going back years, decades. 45 right. years. 44 years, right? <laughs> 1980, yeah, 79, right. yes. Check my math, yeah, good. Yeah, uh, But not just that. There were also allegations yeah. that in 2016 that the Trump campaign was involved in trying to do some stuff behind the scenes with, with Israel and with, with Turkey. Um, and then there are also... Uh, maybe non-political campaign related things, Bill Richardson's mm -hmm. efforts um, and others uh, of that ilk. Um, are you saying that, or are you discouraging any non-governmental attempt to um, free Evan and Paul uh, Gershkovich and uh, Paul Whelan? A few things about that. We would welcome any productive efforts to secure the release of Evan and Paul. I'm not aware of any non-governmental efforts. Um, I would hope that anyone pursuing such an effort would do it in coordination with the United States government. As I said, I'm not aware of any now, but I think that would be an important principle. Um, but the other principle I said I think is the most important thing, which is we want to see them released now. Not right. No, no. Fair road. enough. But I mean, but you, it doesn't matter to you guys what, if there is such an effort going on, whether it is potentially politically motivated or not I think we I would I would want to we would want to see that effort fully coordinated with the United States government beside that I don't think I want to go too far down the rabbit hole of hypotheticals right. so thank you. with that we'll wrap for today thanks